Okay guys, in this video we're going to talk about immunology and in particular the adaptive immune response. So in humans in particular, the adaptive immune response is the production of antibodies against a very specific antigen on the surface of a pathogen. So adaptive means specific immune reaction, normally through the production of antibodies against a sp specific type of antigen on the surface of the pathogen. So this is going to be split into two main immune reactions. One is the humoral response and one is the cell mediated response. And they both interlink as part of this adaptive immune response. So we can put adaptive, which really means uh, immune response versus a specific antigen. Now, bear in mind, the antigen is any molecule on the surface of the pathogen, and it could be part of the peptidoglycan cell wall of a gram-positive bacterium. It could be part of the capsid protein uh, envelope of a virus, for example. So we're going to start with um, this reaction over on the left. Now, this is called a phagocytic cell. So you've done phagocytosis in the cells topic. And one type of phagocytic cell is called a macrophage. There are other types, and you don't need to know the names, but macrophage is a specific type of phagocytic cell. So these uh, squares or rectangles over on the left are the pathogen. So it could be, in this case, a bacterial infection. So let's just put here pathogen. And we know phagocytosis is going to help to clear the pathogens from the site of infection. So we need to know a little bit about how the macrophage or the phagocytic cell starts to engulf via endocytosis uh, the pathogen. So the first thing we're going to say is the cell membrane of the phagocytic cell is going to fold around the pathogen. And the cell membranes, as it's invaginated or folded around the pathogen, they actually then fuse together. So this pathogen is going to be taken inside the phagocytic cell, inside a phagocytic vesicle. So we could put here phagocytic vesicle. Now, the phagocytic cell has quite extensive Golgi body or Golgi apparatus. And from here, one of the functions of the Golgi apparatus is to make lysosomes. So lysosomes are little vesicles that contain hydrolytic enzymes. So I just put GB for Golgi body or GB, you could put GA for Golgi apparatus. So the lysosomes contain hydrolytic enzymes and the lysosomes then fuse with with the phagocytic vesicle and the hydrolytic enzymes are then released inside the phagocytic vesicle, inside the phagocytic cell. And all molecules of the pathogen get hydrolyzed. So for example, proteins and their peptide bonds will be hydrolyzed into shorter fragments and then by exopeptidases into amino acids. Uh, any polysaccharides, for example, like cellulose, or peptidoglycan or any type of polysaccharide will be hydrolyzed as well into its individual monomers. And that's going to clear the pathogen from the infection site. Now, what happens is the macrophage presents. So I'm just going to put a big receptor protein here on the cell membrane of the phagocytic cell. A fragment of the pathogen on its cell membrane. So a macrophage or a phagocytic cell is called an antigen presenting cell. Now that's going to be important because we're going to see a bit later, the T helper cell has a receptor protein that recognizes that particular presented antigen. Now the other cell type we've got at the same time is called a B lymphocyte. So a lymphocyte is a specialized type of leukocyte, which is just a the general name for a white blood cell. Now the B lymphocytes on their cell membrane have membrane bound antibodies actually on the cell membrane that project outwards. And we've got thousands, millions of different types of B lymphocytes in our bloodstream, in our blood plasma, 
and also in our lymph fluid. And each B lymphocyte has a slightly different shaped antibody on its cell membrane. So these antibodies here, which are membrane bound, these will have exactly the same complementary shape to the shape of a certain antigen. So what happens is the B lymphocytes in your blood plasma or your lymph fluid is going to bind a certain antigen, which we know is on the surface of the pathogen. So only one type of B cell, B lymphocyte, will be able to do this for that particular type of antigen on the surface of the pathogen. And we also get endocytosis happening here. So we've got endocytosis of the pathogen into the B cell. Now, what the B cell does, the B lymphocytes, it's a bit like the phagocytic cell that we had a bit earlier. It's going to present this antigen on its cell membrane. So I'll just do a receptor protein here, and I'm just going to put in the antigen. So the B lymphocytes, with its antibodies on its cell membrane, makes a re receptor protein that's going to present the antigen on its cell membrane. So again, an, a B lymphocyte is called an antigen presenting cell. So the phagocytic cell and the B lymphocyte are both professional antigen presenting cells. Now what we also have in the blood plasma or the, the lymph fluid, if it's the lymphatic capillaries, is a T helper cell. Now, again, we've got thousands and millions of T helper cells and what they have on their cell membrane is a receptor protein. I'll just do it here. That is complementary in shape to the presented antigen on the B lymphocyte or even the macrophage, the phagocytic cell. So let's just color this in yellow. So this is a receptor cell. It's called the T cell receptor, TCR, T cell receptor on the cell membrane of the T helper cell. And that has a complementary shape to the shape of the presented antigen. So I'm just going to put here, TCR is a T cell receptor and it's a complementary shape to the shape of the antigen presented by the B lymphocyte. So we could say here, this protein in the cell membrane of the B lymphocyte is presenting the antigen to the T helper cell. Now, once we get this interaction between the T cell receptor and presented antigen, that's going to activate the T helper cell to make chemicals called cytokines. So cytokines are chemicals. Sometimes you might see the word interleukin. That's just a certain type of cytokine made and secreted by the T helper cell. And what they're going to do is they're going to activate and further promote the B lymphocyte to become activated which is then going to undergo clonal expansion. So that B lymphocyte is going to divide by cell division that involves mitosis. So clonal expansion of the B lymphocyte that's been activated is via mitosis. And we're going to get thousands of genetically identical daughter cells from the original B lymphocyte. And that's promoted by the cytokines secreted from the T helper cell. Now, at the same time as the B lymphocyte undergoing clonal expansion, the T helper cell itself will also undergo clonal expansion to make thousands of identical, genetically identical daughter cells from the T helper cell. But we're going to focus on this B lymphocyte response so this is going to be called, this bit here on the left, the humoral response, because it's going to result in the production of antibodies secreted from a specialised type of B cell called a plasma cell. So all these genetically identical daughter cells from the original B lymphocyte uh, are clones, hence the name clonal expansion via mitosis. And half of these daughter cells will become what we call plasma cells. So we'll just put down here, plasma cells. And the other half of the genetically identical daughter cells will become memory B cells. So I'll 
memory. Now, the memory B cells, which are genetically identical and clones to the original B lymphocyte, these will make antibody, exactly the same antibody as was on the cell membrane of the original B lymphocyte. And they'll put these antibodies onto their or into their cell membrane. So these are going to look exactly the same as the original B lymphocyte. So after this first initial clonal expansion, we end up with thousands of memory B cells, all with the same specificity as the original single B lymphocyte that we started at with at the top. This is why, obviously, when you have a vaccine and you have the first injection of vaccine, we're going to get clonal expansion of the B cells and we're going to get thousands of memory B cells. So you only get these at the end of the first injection. And then when you have the second injection of the vaccine, all these memory B cells will, will act very much like the original B lymphocyte. So we don't just have one of these B cells reacting, we have thousands of them. That's why they're called memory B cells. Now, the plasma cells, their job is to make and secrete this antibody into the blood plasma or to, into the lymph fluid. So if we look inside a plasma cell then, these start to differentiate. And in order to secrete, to make and to secrete a protein like an antibody, uh, there needs to be lots of rough ER. So we can draw in the rough ER. And we know rough ER, rough endoplasmic reticulum, as we'd say in the exam, has ATS ribosomes attached to the outside surface. And at the ATS ribosomes, that's where translation takes place to make the antibody proteins. They travel inside the cisterna of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And then bees called pinch off that have packaged the protein inside them. And then they fuse with the Golgi body. And inside the Golgi body, the cisterna of the Golgi body, the proteins get modified. Maybe they have some sugars added to them, like a glycoprotein, for example, and they get folded into their final tertiary and quaternary structures. And then through secretory vesicles that pinch off from the end of the Golgi body, they migrate to infuse with the cell membrane. And that is then going to release and secrete via exocytosis the antibody proteins. So the antibody proteins then, I'll just do as this little B shape. These are now being secreted into the blood from all of these thousands of plasma cells that were made by a clonal expansion of the original B lymphocyte. Now the role of the antibodies then is to agglutinate the pathogen and to clump them together in the infection site to localize the infection. So what they do if this is the pathogen, the tip of the, the Y structure of the antibody is called the antigen binding site. And that's going to be complementary in shape to the shape of the antigen on the surface of the pathogen. So it's going to bind to it to form an antibody antigen complex. And that agglutinates the pathogen. So it helps to stick it together. So imagine we had this scenario and you've got loads of antibodies that have been secreted and are circulating in the blood. Hopefully you guys can see that the pathogens now are started to be clumped together and agglutinated in one specific area. So I'll just put in a few more pathogens. So this clumping is called agglutination of pathogens. And we must remember, okay, that just means clumping, that the antibody binds specifically to an antigen because they're complementary in shape, so they can bind together. And that's called an antibody antigen complex and please don't forget that the secretion of the antibody from the plasma cell is called exocytosis 
and that obviously requires some ATP, so that's a very active process, and it requires the rough endoplasmic reticulum to interact with the Golgi body of the plasma cell and the secretory pathway with their secretory vesicles. Now, the antibody itself then, in terms of its structure, it's made of four polypeptide chains. So you can see here one, two in pink, three in pink, and four in green. So it's a quaternary uh, protein. There's four polypeptide chains, and there's the two green chains are called the light chains because they're shorter, and the two pink chains are called the heavy chains because they are, as you can see, a bit longer. So there's two heavy chains and two light chains. Now, the chains themselves, the polypeptide chains, are held together through disulfide bridges. So please do remember that disulfide bridges occur between R groups of certain amino acids within each of the polypeptide chains. So the R group to R group bonds are going to be disulfide bridges between normally cysteine amino acids within the polypeptide chains. Now, the top part of the antibody, so this bit, is called the antigen binding site. So each polypeptide chain will have a specific tertiary structure and the four different tertiary structures at the tip of the polypeptide chain, the, the way it's folded in a, a globular 3D shape, this will then bind and be complementary to an antigen. So the shape of that antigen. And the other tip of the antibody will also be complementary to the same antigen. So this gives the antibody specificity due to complementary binding shapes between the antigen, uh, the antibody, tip of the antibody, which is the antigen binding site. Okay. Now, if we just also think about the T helper cell, we know that secreted cytokines and they help to activate the B lymphocyte and they promote its clonal expansion into its genetically identical daughter cells, the memory B cells and the plasma cells. But what the cytokines do, they also attract. So let's just do this up here. More phagocytic cells to the infection site. So these cytokines are really important within this adaptive immune response because we've agglutinated the pathogen via the secretion of antibodies from the plasma cells, but we now need to clear the pathogen which is stuck to all these antibodies, and that's the job of the phagocytic cells. So these are now being attracted to the infection site, and we know they can phagocytose the pathogen, which has been clumped via the antibody, via this phagocytic pathway here. Now, the other good thing about the T helper cell is that not only does it bind the presented antigen on the B cell to make it secrete cytokines to attract more phagocytic cells to the infection site, but also it will have a similar response here to the presented antigen on the macrophage. So not only does it interact with the B cell, the T helper cell can also interact with the antigen presenting cell, the phagocytic cell over on the left. So the cytokines play two main roles, one in promoting clonal expansion of the B lymphocyte and one in attracting more phagocytic cells. Now, the interaction of the T helper cell with the B lymphocyte and the T helper cell with the phagocytic cell is called cell mediated immunity. And the production of specific antibodies from the plasma cells, which result from clonal expansion of the lymphocyte, is called the humoral response. humoral immunity. Okay, one more thing to do with the T helper cells then. Um, we know there's actually another type of, of, of T cell, not T helper cell this time, but it's called a cytotoxic T cell. Now, a cytotoxic T cell, if I just draw one here, I'll just do 
that the cytotoxic T cell. Um, that will also have T cell receptors on its cell membrane. But these don't interact with antigen presented on an antigen presenting cell like a B cell. What they do is they actually bind to virus antigen that's presented on any body cells that are infected with virus. So if we get like an epithelial cell that lines the trachea and it's infected with coronavirus, for example, in order to stop the coronavirus replicating inside the epithelial cell that lines the trachea or the, or the bronchi or the bronchioles, we want to damage and destroy those cells and that's going to limit the spread of the viral infection. So the cytotoxic T cell can recognise the virus antigen presented on the cell membrane of those infected cells. And when it binds to it, it's going to release chemicals that directly kill the virus infected body cell. And that's going to limit the spread of the virus because obviously if the cell is killed, uh, the virus can't replicate inside of it. Okay, so just one more comment I'd like to make about this then, if we just move this along a little bit, is vaccinations. So we just have a look at the two graphs on the right-hand side. So the x-axis then shows the time in weeks, and the y-axis is going to show antibody, i just put AB for antibody concentration in the blood plasma, for example. So imagine that there was an infection or it could be injection of a vaccine at this point. What would happen is the concentration of specific antibody being made by plasma cells would go up over several weeks slowly and then it would gradually increase as more plasma cells are making more antibody and then it would peak. And at this point, we'd get maximum agglutination of the pathogen and we'd get phagocytosis to clear the infection from the infection site. And then after this point, once the infection had been cleared, then the antibody in the blood would start to fall and decrease. So this is called the latent period after infection, or I'm just gonna do the first vaccine injection at this point. So very early on, after the first vaccine, there aren't going to be many antibodies, going to be a low antibody concentration in the blood plasma to start with, but then it will peak as the number of plasma cells increases. Because remember, clonal expansion doesn't just happen straight away. It does take time for the cells to replicate and divide through mitosis. So to get one cell become thousands of genetically identical daughter cells is going to take a little bit of time, several weeks, and then we're going to get a peak in antibody concentration. And here, the infection has been cleared. That's why we get a decrease after the um, infection's been removed from the body, or in fact, you know, obviously the, the peak of antibodies after the first vaccine. But the important bit from this graph is to remember that during this process also, memory B cells are also being made. Okay. So on this graph underneath, what I'll do is that the time frame this time is going to be months as opposed to weeks. So I'm going to do the same thing to start with. We'll have the first vaccine at this time point. And then, because I'm going to condense it like this, we'll get the latent period and then we'll get a peak. And then obviously the antibodies, because they, they last about three to four weeks in the blood plasma before they get broken down into their, anti, into their amino acids. So antibodies don't always stay in the blood for that long. They are going to decrease. However, if we had a second injection of vaccine, so this is going to be exactly the same vaccine with exactly the same antigen or antigens. What we're going to see is the latent period is going to be much shorter and actually there's going to be a steeper gradient to the curve and a higher peak. So instead of having this latent period we're going to get quite a rapid increase. So this is much more rapid and we're going to get a higher production of antibody. So the peak is higher after the second vaccine. So there's two things we have to say. There's a more rapid production of antibodies in the blood plasma versus the first injection of vaccine 
and number two there's a higher concentration of specific antibody so more rapid production and a higher concentration of specific ant antibody now this is because this bit after the second vaccine there are memory b cells present so here there were no memory b cells on the first injection but they're made through clonal expansion of the b lymphocyte and when you've got b cells present you're going to get a more rapid production of antibody in the blood and a higher peak concentration of that specific antibody which is why obviously we're going to get even more even more memory b cells being made after the second injection here because each memory b cell will act similar to the original b, b lymphocyte and each one of these will undergo clonal expansion when it um, interacts with that specific t helper cell again and please do remember that the T helper cells that undergo clonal expansion themselves will form T memory cells, which is why we get this more rapid increase in antibody production and higher peak on the second vaccine or even the second infection with the same pathogen with the same antigens.